Welcome to David and David on Real Estate. Join us as we explore the ins and outs of the real estate market. Good morning, David. And I can't believe I'm smiling today because, uh, you know, we just had our federal election and um, not quite the outcome that I was hoping for. But uh, I certainly, um, you know, understand where Canadians are coming from, that's for sure. Well, good morning, David. And yeah, it's, uh, you know, you, you sit back and reflect, I guess, afterwards and say, you know, what happened? And um, somehow, I think I may have mentioned it to you last week before the election, I, I somehow end up on the wrong side of the vote in every election, federally, provincially. You know, my writing always seems to go a different way than, I, than I'm going. And, um, and I'm not always with the same party. I look at every election, you know, differently, but somehow I seem to be on the wrong side uh, too often of these things. So uh, I don't know, I don't think we influenced anybody uh, in, in voting. I don't know if you feel the same way. You know, it, it's a tough one because, you know, I, I think just like you said, David, Canadians usually get it right, right, by and large. Um, and uh, I'm not sure that they did this time around. You know, this is this is a tough election. Um, I don't know what Justin Trudeau gained by calling this federal election because um, ultimately nothing has really changed. He still has a minority government, despite you know having the highest approval ratings before the election. The only thing I see uh, that really transpired is you know a lot of division is, has been created, and he spent six hundred fifty million dollars. Right, and. You know, I, I'm a believer that the, that the public generally gets it right anyways, even if I'm on the wrong side of it, uh, because I think the, the we needed a minority government again. Yeah. And I wasn't sure going in it, whether it was going to where the conservatives would have enough to get a, a minority government themselves. But I was pretty confident that Trudeau wasn't going to get a majority government with what was going on. And I think the, the Canadians figured that out one way or another, uh, you know, and I think Trudeau miscalculated thinking that this was an opportunity because the conservatives weren't quite ready and nobody knew their leader. And, uh, you know, so he was trying to gain that advantage and thought he would grab majority. And I think people looked at it the other way and said, well, hang on a second. Uh, we're not so sure we want to give you an absolute reign over this country for the next four to five years with the majority. So maybe they agreed that the conservatives were quite quite ready to take over, but um, but but at least they'll have a strong minority position in the government, and then we'll see what the conservatives do going forward. So I sort of think that you know the public maybe got got it right in terms of getting a minority government, one yeah. way or the other. I agree completely. Well, there's lots to talk about, David. But before we get too deep into uh, into what happened and, and the election results, I just I want to take a couple minutes and give everybody a, a market update. Um, it's September 2021. And usually at this time, we start seeing more listings come on the market. You know, it's past uh, Labor Day. Kids are back at school. And usually we see more listings coming on the market. But that just isn't the case. And even though we are seeing a slight increase, uh, usually historically around this time, we see many more listings coming on the market, but sellers are just not rushing to the market. And I think it's a number of issues that are influencing that decision. You know, it being COVID, people are still unsure. They don't want people in their home. Um, and the other major influencing issue is the fact that, you know what, we are talking a lot more about inflation and prices rising. And, you know, your money not being able to command and have the same buying power as it did in the past. And sellers have learned the painful lesson that, you know, whenever they sell their property over the last 15 years, they've always made a mistake in the past because their property continues to appreciate in value. And the appreciation that we've seen over the last 12 months has been astronomical. So I think a lot of people are hanging on to their properties. They're not selling. And it's causing uh, a shortage of inventory in the market. Yeah, and I've, I've talked to uh, quite a few people um, in the late 20 to mid 30 range uh, recently. And, you know, and some of them have already got their first home and would like to move into the second home. 
and they know they'll do well with the property that they're currently living in and going to sell, but they feel they're going to get clobbered in buying what they want to buy, that step up property. Uh, because when they go to anything comes on the market in that category, there's multiple offers on it and it, it just gets out of control. And then they can't get the financing at the level that they need to complete th those transactions based on that price. And it's it's a problem. And I think it all goes to the to the supply side, like like you said, there's just not enough out there. So it's sort of a wait and see. We need more to come on the market before the, all these people that are willing to get in there that want to sell, want to buy something else. But I think they're waiting for there to be more on the market because right now they're just going to, they're just going to be involved in the bidding war. And then they're, if they win, they're going to struggle to get financing. Yeah, you definitely have to buy first and, and sell, sell second in this market just to know exactly you know, where you stand and uh, to make sure you navigate, navigate that situation correctly. <clears throat> when you take a look at the number of new listings year over year, we're down 21% for the same time period, um, September 1st to September um, 22nd compared to 2020 to 2021. When we look at the number of solds, again, we're down 25% year over year. And, and that just uh, means that there's less listing, so less are selling, but the absorption rate uh, still maintains uh, about the same. Number of showings were up 2%, so there is demand, even though there's less listings coming on the market. And the number of offers is up 24%. So buyers are trying to get into the market. They are trying to transact, but you know there's, there's a lot of competition out there for the listings that are coming on the market. The average price is up 16% year over year, which is unbelievable. And the days on the market are down 14%. So meaning whatever does come on the market sells on average about 14% faster than it did last year. So, I mean, very telling statistics about where we are. Number of listings down, price up, days on the market down, um, and absorption rate still remains uh, very, very high. So great seller's market. If you have investment properties, if you have multiple properties, if you're thinking about downsizing if you're thinking about selling some of your investment properties great time right now to take some risk off the market and really capitalize on uh, on the current environment because there's just nothing out there to to look at when if you are a buyer um so really geared towards sellers right now yeah it's, it's strictly supply and demand and i know it takes us both back to our university days in, in economics and seeing those graphs and everything. And it's really that basic. It's that, it's that simple. Uh, you know, a 16% increase year over year is pretty remarkable, even for the, for the GTA. Uh, you know, that's a two to three year increase in a normally really good market, yeah. not even like an average market. So, you know, that's, that's pretty unbelievable. And it's going to continue going that way unless there's more supply on the market. So what type of strategies do you discuss with your agents about you know, getting things on the market, convincing sellers uh, to, to get out there and, and put more on the market? Well, we, we definitely encourage our agents to have the tough conversations with their clients, right? And they have to really guide their clients in the right way to make sure that the whole transaction from start to finish is very smooth. But we are focusing a lot on investor clients right now. So again, you know, sending out the message that the market is very strong, that it is a great time to, um, you know, sell some of that excess uh, property that you have. But if you're transacting when it comes to your personal residence, you know, it's really important to get the timing right, to understand the market, to go out there and do the legwork um, and to make sure that your house is prepped, it, it's staged, it looks its best. And when you do find that perfect property that you want to pull the trigger on, then, um, you know, you don't have to do any legwork and, and your house is ready to, to be sold uh, in a fairly short period of time as well. Well, that's, that's a pretty good strategy, I think. You're basically telling the agents, there is this bit of a lull right now. We're not sure how long it's going to last. We never know. Uh, but in the meantime, there's other things that you could be doing. There's other ways you could be doing transactions. 
um, as an agent, but there's also other ways you could be convincing your clients to do transactions. It's still a great market to invest in. So get off the principal residence uh, focus right now and, and look at investment properties is another way of, uh, of, you know, for agents to earn their commissions, but also to encourage clients to potentially make some money. Uh, and look for their their long term uh, future growth. So that's that's a pretty good strategy. It's better than sitting around doing nothing, which which I hear from some agents that I talk to. What's going on? Oh, nothing. What are you doing? Uh, nothing. I'm you know I'm working out. I'm you know I'm, uh, I'm you know trying to go away. Can't go anywhere. Trying to figure out what to do. Well, what about making a living? What are you doing about that? And some are just sitting around waiting for the market to turn, which is never a Great answer. Yeah, and, and I think right now, David, I mean, people have their attention on social media. So talking about the market, talking about statistics, talking about investing, you know, showing people the numbers, being in front of them and, you know, touching base with them, seeing how they're doing, how the family is doing, how everybody's being uh, impacted, um, you know, kids back to school, how's your, how are your kids doing? And, and, and just having that human element will go such a long way to getting you more business and getting in front of your clients and, and, and really working on those relationships, right? So it, even when you're not busy in real estate, I think working in your relationship, visiting your past clients, touching base with them, seeing if they're okay, sending small little gifts, dropping something small off for them. Um, you know, those are the things that everybody should be doing in, in their downtime, right? Prospecting is the most important uh, thing to, uh, to to keep developing and working on your business. Right. So you as a, as a business owner are constantly reminding your your agents that there's there's always something you could do. There's other elements of your business that you can be focusing on when you're not busy running around showing properties uh, day and night. Um, so that when that does come around, they're more organized, they're better suited, they're, they're, they've farmed a bigger area, and they're ready to go. 100%, right? Yeah, and, and we have to, you know, shift our focus a little bit too as a law firm. We've been so busy the last, uh, you know, four months with closings, and, and I think I probably mentioned this in other uh, podcasts we've done. I'm always, we're always short staff. We've been hiring and interviewing, like, the whole time, and and, and growing and everything. And now we finally got to a point where we, you know, we've got some good quality people on board and we're, we get them trained. We're all ready to go. And all of a sudden the market turns and, and we're really starting to feel a, a slowdown in our volume. So, which is, which is okay because we'll just, you know, there, it gives us some catch up time. It gives us some cleanup time internally. We still got lots of transactions to do and we'll, we'll use that time to be ready and and uh and by the time we get to the spring market which we know will be an upturn market it always is uh you know we're well manned and and well womaned i guess i should say we've got lots of people trained quality people to uh to get us through the next surge in, in the market yeah. and it's it's tough as a business owner right like when you're busy and you're firing in all cylinders um you still need to business develop Right. Because, you know, when when the slowdown comes, you still want to be able to put coal in the engine and, and power through and, and keep growing. So as a business owner, and I know you guys do this extremely well, um, you know, the relationship that we have with you guys and we've had for 32 years is one example of, of you know, how you get in front of agents and how you guys keep yourselves front of mind. Um, by being that resource that all the realtors go to. But what are some of the other business development uh, stuff that your, your, your law firm does on a regular basis, David? Well, yeah, a lot of it is, like you say, focused with, with the real estate agents and the brokers themselves. Uh, so uh, we're available, we, you know, we do trainings, we do seminars and webinars uh, now. You know, so we, we always focus on that and different conferences. Uh, that we attend, uh, you know, to get out there. And, and, but part of the message, no matter what, what I'm doing when I'm in front of a group of agents is always, okay, when you have a transaction, we want to make sure that they understand that we're available and, and that we have a group approach as support. Like we, we always consider us as, as part of the team with the agents and we're not adversarial with the agents, you know, that we get things, you know, if an agent screws up, we're not looking to throw them under the bus. We're looking to help us find a solution that'll work 
for the client, do we have a mutual client? So our focus has to be on the mutual client and find a solution. And so we're always focusing on that. So every opportunity we have to, to meet or, or talk to agents, we're always focusing with that. But that's what, what we're doing. It, it's seminars and webinars and training sessions and attending conferences and things like that. It, you know, it'd be great to get back to the days when we can do it live. It just, it's a huge difference when you can actually you know, go around a room and, and, and meet people and talk to people. Because every time you do that, someone comes up to you, oh, you know, hey, David, I've got something like, can I run this by you? And here's a situation. And before you know it, you know, we're, we're getting work in that way. And that's a little bit different than on a Zoom meeting. Yeah, and, and you know what, David, I, I always admire that about your business because you guys have been so available, right? And it's just like you said, the next time an agent has a tough question, you know, they call you and all of a sudden they're sending that file to you because they build trust and rapport and they know that you're going to make yourself just as available to their clients as you are to them and you're going to help them work through the tough issues, right? And, uh, uh, you know, that's been, you know, our biggest uh, strength that we, we lean on on our relationship with your law firm. And it's been absolutely wonderful. Yeah, you know, and the good news is in our industry, most transactions close relatively smoothly you know, on, on residential transactions. But there are issues come up all the time. We've talked to it before that, you know, as many transactions we do, there's always something that comes up that you've never seen before, and it's, it, which is remarkable because you think the number of transactions, the way our system is, uh, everything should be cookie cutter, but somehow they're not. And issues come up and you've got to put out sometimes small fires, sometimes bigger fires. The focus is always on getting the transaction closed. That's always the, the way to serve the clients best. And so, so that's the approach that, that you know that we, that we take and we encourage the agents to take too. It's uh, let's, what's, let's look at the solution. We, okay, we've got an understanding of the problem. Okay, we don't care who caused the problem, who created the problem, let's find the solution together and figure out how we do it. So that's, that's what we preach in our office all the time, our weekly lawyer meetings and our staff meetings. That, that's our focus. And, I'm, and we're not alone. I'm not saying we're the only law firm that does it, but there's, a, there's some that do it like us. And there's, unfortunately, there's too many in the industry that don't do it that way. Yeah, I agree. And they focus, it becomes an adversarial thing right away. And um, that's not good for the industry. There's always a solution that works, that you should be able to work through and, and just have to find it. Yeah, no, I agree. Absolutely. And if you have that team approach where, you know, you know, the agent, the lawyer, the appraiser, the mortgage broker, you know, we're all a team and our common goal is to close the transaction and make sure that the buyer and seller, whoever we represent comes out ahead. Right. And if you have that approach, everybody wins. Right. And occasionally somebody in that team might drop the ball a little bit or wasn't as clear in their documentation as they maybe should have been. And, and that creates an issue or a gray area or something. But, but that doesn't mean you, you, you get rid of that team member right away. It's, you know, accidents happen. Everybody's not perfect. Everybody doesn't have all the information sometimes when they give the advice that they're giving. So you got to look at it from that point of view. And it's not like, oh, the mortgage broker did what? And, you know, oh, then you got a terrible mortgage. You, you know, if you had a different mortgage broker, we wouldn't be in this situation. Like that's never an answer to give to somebody. I don't think, even if we think that that's a possibility that they may have totally screwed it up or the lawyer, like, you know, or the, or the law clerk or something. I'm not saying our, our office is, is perfect. Just stuff happens sometimes, but you can't look at the world that way. You have to look at the, look at it, that there's a solution somewhere. Let's fix it. Okay. Yeah. The blame game doesn't help anybody. Like the, the answer can be, Oh, someone screwed up. Let's, let's sue them. Let's go to litigation. Let's drop them from the team. Right, uh, you, you need to build good team uh, and good people that you can refer people to, and we all learn from each other too. So there's an, an advantage uh, to that, right? It's like the same thing, you know. When we always go back to sports, you know, the Leafs or or the Blue Jays, you know, someone you know comes up and you know the Blue Jays top of the ninth, bases loaded, and you know we're all dying for them to get that hit, but you know, 75% of the time, they're not going to get that hit, you know, uh, you know, 70% of the time, the best hitter is not going to get that hit. 
statistically. So when they don't get that, you know, you, you get rid of them, you throw them under the bus. No, you, you know, you try and give them all the, the manager tries to give them all the best information, the best scouting they got on the pitcher. And they're still hitting, um, you know, a, a round ball with a round barreled bat. And it doesn't always go where you want it. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's a great analogy. You, you got to support that person. You got to stack everything in their favor. You know, you got to be their biggest cheerleader. But if, you know, if he doesn't make that hit, you still got to support them and encourage right. them for next time, right? And right. the whole team mentality, everybody comes together. And if somebody drops the ball, you pick it up and, and you know, you make sure that the uh, final outcome is what you want it to be, which is a great approach. That's exactly the way it should be. And, um, you know, I think with that approach, any, any professional that refers their clients to, to your law firm will know that, you know, they're not going to be made look bad their client is going to always be serviced and no matter what happens, right? Cause there's so many different aspects of a real estate transaction, right? To make it go smooth, to close, like appraisal has to come in, mortgage broker has to send the play paperwork on time. Lawyer has to do title searches. The realtor has to do their job, right? So there's a lot of things that have to fall into place and, and you're absolutely right. You know, sometimes the ball does get dropped inadvertently, but the rest of the team is there to pick it up and, and to make sure that uh, everything functions smoothly. Right. And you know, back to the baseball analogy, you know, sometimes, you know, you've got one out and guys on base and, and the pitcher throws a great pitch and gets a ground ball to somebody and, and they boot it and it's an error. And so the focus has to be, okay, well, now we need a double play to get out of the inning. And, and you hope you get the next one to get out of the inning. It can't be, Oh, this guy, you know, keeps booting the ball around, like, right. You got to focus on what's in front of you, find, find the solution, find the way out. So I, I think as any business owner, uh, I think that's an approach that you have to consider because otherwise you're just, you're burning bridges and you're turning people over all the time. And, and uh, you know, that's not what you want. You don't want to keep building the team. You want to add on but you don't want to keep throwing out good players and look for the next player and hope that they're going to be good until they screw up and then they're gone too. And, and David, this concept is really transferable to any business, right? It doesn't matter what kind of business you have. You always want to make sure that the people you work with or the people that you do business feel good about the transaction and feel good about, you know, the partners, right? So like, for example, you know, if let, let's say you have a logistical company, and, and, you know, another trucking company comes in, right, and, and comes into your reception area, and you say, oh, my God, you know, I can't believe, you know, you're doing so and so, they're such a great company, right, and just that one touch point will go a long way to really improving that relationship you have with, with that one supplier or, or that one person you interact with, right, because they're like, wow, you know, this person feels good about me, right, I want to do more business with them. Right. And, and you, you pick any industry and they, they have to build a team around them too. their internal team, but it's also their, their network of, of other companies that they have to partner with any industry. Like there's nothing I've said here so far that's new or that I invented or created. It, it's stuff that, you know, that you pick up over the years, but because you see the approach that other people take. Uh, you know, not, I'm not using examples necessarily in the law profession. I've seen law firms that are really successful and a whole bunch of uh, law firms that were successful for a point in time, and then they disappeared off the planet. Uh, same thing happens in under in other industries. And a lot of it comes back to leadership and the type of, uh, of leadership that you, you provide and, and, and where your focus is, you know, like you and I both come from sports backgrounds and we've talked before, you're only as a team is only as good as their weakest players, uh, you know, having a good role to play. And as a leader, you have to find those roles and get to people's strengths and find out what they want to do and push them in the direction that they're comfortable with to get them as productive as possible. And if you do that, it doesn't matter your logistics company, a brokerage, a law firm, uh, you know, those are key success to, to any business, not, oh, this is our weakest link. Let's get rid of them. Yeah, no, completely agree. So, David, shifting back to uh, the federal election. Well, this is a, a good segue. We're talking about leadership. Yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah, and that's what a lot of the election came down to. Right. It did. Absolutely. And the timing of it as well. Right. 
Yeah. So what are your thoughts? Well, um, I'm happy we have a minority government, right? I'm happy that, uh, um, you know, the current government is going to be in check. I mean, Justin Trudeau did a really great job with um, making sure that everybody was taken care of when, when, when COVID first hit, making sure that financially, you know, all the business owners and, um, and, and, and people that were impacted by, by the lockdowns, um, you know, had a way through, right? And his approval rating showed it. I mean, his approval ratings were the highest that we've seen um, during the pandemic, right? And it's how he approached the whole situation. I think Canadians were surprised that he called an election. I, I know I was, um, but um, I, I think that that is also reflected in, in the fact that we do have a minority government right now. Yeah, I think so too. And I think everybody was prepared to, to give Trudeau a pass when the pandemic started. Um, I, I was very impressed with the opposition parties that they, that they were trying to give him some rope and trying to be supportive in those days. You know, like no one was planning on a pandemic. Nobody had experienced a pandemic before. I'm sure the other leaders were looking at, you know, themselves and, you know, what would, what would I do? What would we do? Like, we don't know either. We all, everybody had to figure it out. Nobody had a platform. This is what we do if there's a pandemic. So I think everybody gave him a lot of leeway. And I, I think he did a lot of good things at, at the time. I think he made a few like really bad calls in particular, you know, he was banking on China to, to come up with the vaccine and, and, or, you know, maybe Canada will create a new plant so we can create our own vaccine. Well, that'll, you know, by the time that's done, that, you know, might help for, a, for three or four pandemics from now. Right. So you know, he made some, some questionable calls and, and, and decisions. Um, but overall he, as a country, I think we got through those first few waves better than a lot of countries. We weren't, we never experienced what they were experiencing in Spain and in Italy, where they're, they're making decisions because they're out of beds and you know, who are we going to save and who are we going to treat? We don't have enough to treat everybody. And the U.S. had that experience. And we never, you know, we had some hot spots, but, but we didn't get into, into quite that. And Canadians are more obedient too. When you say stay home, they do. You know, Americans, they stay home. They say, I have the right not to stay home. I, and they just want to, you know, I have the right to get sick. I have the right to die. Uh, we, we don't, that's not our first thought as Canadians. They say, stay home. You know, the majority tends to stay home. And I think that kept us safer too. So we're just more compliant nation, I guess, to some extent. But I'm prepared to give Trudeau credit for you know, where it's due and, I, and also look at, at where his mistakes are and what could have been done differently. But no one had a crystal ball. Yeah. I have to look back at that situation now and say, well, you could have done this differently, right? I mean, when you're in the moment and you have to make those tough decisions, it's, it's also very, very different than, you know, looking back at it now and, and having the um, benefit of knowing, you know, what those decisions at the time led to uh, today, right? Right. And, and what are the priorities when you're making those tough decisions? Any different from your priority as a, as a broker owner or my priority for law firm? What we were talking about, you know, my partner, Jonathan, I, every time that this issue came up back in the days, it was like, okay, priority number one is keep everybody safe and healthy. Okay. And yeah, we're business owners. Yeah, we want to stay in business. Yeah, we got to figure that out. We hope we don't get shut down. You're going through all that. But priority one was still let's be safe. Let's keep our family safe. Let's keep our staff safe. Let's keep everybody safe. So let's figure out that first. And then let's figure out how we could stay in business and how we could do business differently and everything. But priority one is still being safe. And I think that's the approach that the government had as well. And, and that's the right thing. And now, okay, but if we're telling everybody to stay home, certain businesses are going to be in trouble. So now we got to think about step two, step one, keep everybody safe. Step two, how do we how do we keep businesses in business? How do we subsidize people who are telling us to stay home and we're saying you're not an essential service, you can't operate and, and, and you got to stay home for the good of the country. So we got to throw in some money. So now they come up with some programs, which are good. You know, part three is like, how are we going to pay for all of this? 
and and I feel like you know that's the part that hasn't really been discussed at all. Um, and that's where I think you know our current government is really dropping the ball, right? Because we still don't have a clear plan how how this debt is going to be repaid. But I mean, you know, money can be produced out of thin air. It has to come from somewhere and has to be repaid at some point. Yeah, unless you're a federal government, because you actually can print money, uh, which which just creates inflation and creates, you know, it, it's just pushing the ball down the road a little bit, or, you know, it, it's, the problem's going to be there. It's just a question of when you're going to address it, and how much is it going to cost us. So, you know, that's what I, I really want to see the focus of the election on to some degree, but I, I think that would have been the focus of an election coming up in the normal course, but because this was a you know, a, a quick call, you know, for a premature election. I, I don't think a lot of the issues really got discussed. And, uh, and I'm not sure the voters cared about a lot of that stuff because a lot of the platforms weren't very clear on what they were going to do. It was more, you know, do we, I think the, issue, the whole issue was do we want a minority government or do we want a majority government? I think that was the, the main issue that was on the table foreign policy wasn't discussed at all debt repayment wasn't discussed at all you know it, it, it was a very uh quick election and um you know even when you and i spoke a couple of times before doing the podcasts um you know a lot of the parties were were wavering on certain platform issues and topics and um you know, the liberal government at one point came out and said they're going to be taxing uh, your 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 primary residence. Then a couple of days before the election, a whole bunch of candidates uh, wrote on their social media that they're not taxing um, your primary residence. Like, I mean, there was a lot of misinformation going around, even from within the parties. Right, and and part of it is is pure politics. Like, like the liberal government is the one that floated the concept originally. They that, they, that they're considering taxing print, you know, capital gains on principal residences, but they didn't put that as a clear part of their platform for this election. They just sort of floated it out there. It's one of the things that they're looking at. So then the conservative government and the NDP, excuse me, the parties, you know, jump on that when there's an election saying, hey, you know, don't give them a majority because if you do, this is what they're, they might do. And, you know, we talked about that in last week's podcast. Right. So I think you and I agree. If that is your policy, put it on your plot. Let's have an election. Let's tell us why that might be good. If that's if tax and capital, you know, capital gain tax on your principal is a good thing, because this is how much revenue we're going to generate. This is what we're going to do with the money. And, and it somehow it's got to be a benefit to people. If it, I don't know, I don't, I don't see it personally, but tell us, show us your study, explain it to us, put it on the, put it in, you know, on the ballot. Right. But they didn't do that. But then everybody plays politics about that issue. And I think it's one of the factors that came into, well, we don't want to risk that. So we don't, we really would rather get a minority government. So they don't do something that's not on the ballot. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. And I think open and transparency when it comes to politics is, is really paramount. And I couldn't agree more with you, Dave. I mean, you know, if that's what it's going to take to repay all this debt, then I, I think, you know, it, the question should have been put in front of Canadians, right? And I think we should have had a conversation, a very in-depth conversation, a debate surrounding that topic, because, you know, maybe that is, uh, a, you know, a way, one of the ways to, to solve our debt issues, right? Uh, I personally think it's a horrible idea and, and would not be in support of it, but, you um, you know, it'd be interesting to see how the majority of Canadians feel about that topic. Yeah, and they're going to get pushback in a coalition government from the NDP and the Bloc. Uh, you know, it's not going to be so accepted. So I, I'm thankful that it's a minority right because I think we're not going to see that get approved. Okay, yeah. and if they really want to work on that over the next couple of years, the next election, then they're going to have to explain that. And, and I think they're going to have to put it on the ballot. You know, in the meantime, there's other issues, you know, other ways that, you know, the liberals were talking about that would affect the real estate market, you know, how it, some of their policies for affecting supply chains and things like that and, and uh, bill of rights for, for buyers. But, you know, but all of that, at least in, now in a minority government situation, there will be input from the other parties yeah. in, in order for them to pass any of that type of legislation. 
it, it seemed to me like the liberal platform really focused on the buyer side of the equation, right? When you look at demand and supply, you know, let's empower buyers, let's, you know, make bidding more transparent, let's make sure that we don't have blind bidding, let's, you know, give more power to buyers. And, you know, I, I think that's a dangerous way of looking and trying to solve this issue, right? Because I, I think at the, uh, you know, the sellers are the ones that take the risk. They're the ones that have skin in the game. They're the ones that, you know, work really hard to, you know, become homeowners and, and, and to have this asset that they're paying mortgage and property taxes for and utilities and then, you know, construction and improvement costs and carrying costs. And I think, you know, those are the people that took the risk and have their skin in the game those are the rights that we really have to protect, right? How do we focus on getting the price down? Well, let's focus on the supply part of the equation. Canada is the second largest country in the world. We have an abundance of land. A lot of the land that we have is protected under the Niagara Escarpment Commission, under the Conservation Authority. We need to start lifting those restrictions in a responsible manner. But we need to allow more development. We need to cut the red tape. You know, we need to lower development charges. We need to uh, make development easier. We need to encourage people to develop more property, right? And I think we spoke about this last podcast. When's the last time you saw a developer building rental units? Right. You know, like, like look at Kanaf. You know, and what happened in the '70s and '80s. Like, I mean that's all they did is build rental units, beautiful, you know, state of the art rental buildings. I remember when my family first immigrated to Canada, we lived um, on Sherby Road in Mississauga. And uh, Dave, I mean, that building is still like, like state of the art today. Like there were tennis courts, there was a beautiful indoor uh, swimming pool. There was a billiards room. There was a table tennis room where you know, I probably spent every single night since the time I was six years old to the time, you know, we lived in the building playing table tennis, you know, which, which for me developed one of my biggest passions in my life is, you know, I, I, I played, played table tennis on the team um, up until I was about, you know, 23 years of age. Right. So, I mean, those memories are, are very near and dear to my heart. And, it was amazing growing up in, in that building and, you know, having other kids participate and go swimming every night and go play tennis and go play table tennis and try billiards and, you know, having um, all those amenities under my, under, under my fingertips. But rental buildings like that are not being built anymore, right? No. And you immigrants coming into Canada, you know, are, are, are not going into buildings like that. Right now, because of our immigration policy and who we let into this country, you know, these people are buying houses on day one. So it's a, it's a very different world out there that, uh, you know, my family and I lived in when we first immigrated into the country. Yeah, the immigration policy completely shifted away from immigrants. Like, you know, you've got a history in your family. You know, my family was was no different you know, when they immigrated to Canada. Uh, you know, it's, it's three generations ago already somehow, but but it was like, but but coming in with nothing right. and and being prepared to roll up their sleeves and work and take all the hard jobs and, and a lot of remote locations, you know, like my dad's family, uh, you know, when they, they came over and my grandparents, uh, you know, they wanted to come to Toronto. They knew about Toronto and Montreal. They weren't allowed to come. Uh, to those cities because the, the government wanted at that time, you know, you can come to Canada, but we want to populate some of the other places. We need, we need people to work elsewhere. So they ended up in uh, Naranda, Quebec. And my grandfather worked in the mines in, oh. in Naranda. Um, you know, and my dad and, and my uncles growing up, you know, that's where, that were their summer jobs, you know, working in the mines. It to the, eventually, you know, uh, you know, my, my grandfather, Actually, probably because he hurt his back in the mines, he went into retail and went into, you know, and opened up a, a store, a, a menswear store. And eventually my, my dad and my uncle ended up in the menswear business, but that's how they, they got there. Otherwise, we, we could have all still been miners for, for all I know.
but but those were the jobs that were they were told was available you want to come to Canada okay you got to go somewhere and do that you know my other grandfather uh, you know went to Edmonton to work uh, you know he was working with you know as a tinsmith and then got back to Toronto because here there was a train going to Toronto and they needed someone to herd cattle and help bring cattle which he knew nothing about so he became a cowboy all of a sudden and you know to bring a herd of cattle to Toronto which is how he ended up in Toronto but our immigration policies have shifted since then now you can't come to the country unless you've got you've got money you've got resources and like you said the the, the immigrants coming are coming with money to buy houses and it's not even starter homes it's you know and, and they're buying more than one property and, and we have to build more houses for them david that i mean that's the bottom line if we want to change this market in a big way and, and really influence it other than band-aid solution you know we have to stop looking at the demand aspect of it Canada's a great country you know everybody wants to live here we have clean air clean water i mean you you and i you know we talked about this time and time again Right? We, we got to make more housing af uh, affordable for them and build more, more houses. And, and the only way to do that is to, you know, lift buildings, lift the red tape, you know, encourage builders to build more rental property and, and, and more housing and, you know, give them loans and, 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 and just encourage more construction. Yeah, and, and allow more density, you know, change the rules a little bit on the density and what they're allowed to build so they have more opportunity to be profitable too. You've got to give the entrepreneurs incentive to, to do things that they can make some money on as well, or they're not going to do it. Like Canik would still be building rental properties if it was if they could make money doing it. Oh, 100%. Right? And Dave, uh, the other thing is like, I don't see the government like really investing in infrastructure. You know, in order to have density, we also need the infrastructure to support that density, right? Like, I almost feel like we have to take 10 steps back and really go back to basics and make sure that, you know, we can support, you know, building up and, and, and having more supply. Like Toronto has been talking about expanding their subway systems. And I know that they expanded the main lines, but we need more, right? We need, we need, we need more access to transportation. We need to eliminate our... our traffic or congestion problems um we need to start doing these things and and the government has clearly demonstrated in the last year and a half that if they really want to and if push comes to shove they have the resources available to you know write checks right and we need to start making some big decisions about our infrastructure issue because we you know as much as i want to turn on the tab and start building more houses at the, at the same time, you know, we need to be able to support that growth as well, right? Yeah. And the other thing I'd like to do, I'd like to see done, and we're seeing it a little bit more, is I would love to see a grassroots approach to getting more skilled labor in the construction industry, right? I'd like to see, you know, our youth really being encouraged to you know, take up employment and, and, and more hands-on job training in the construction industry. I think we have a huge shortage of construction workers, of skilled labor. And I think we need to address it from a real grassroots perspective as well. And we need a government that's gonna actually start looking at some of these things in more detail. Well, and that, that uh, construction industry issue is, again, goes back to our immigration policies too. Because you know it's immigrants coming to the Canada to Canada um, that would normally be prepared to take up some of those jobs, but not if the only people they're allowing in are people who in their in their previous countries were you know doctors and dentists and architects and other professionals, and they'd want to come here and just continue that because they and Canada's letting them in because they've got some some money. We we need some some people that are coming here that are prepared to take the you know those those labor jobs as well because we can't i agree with you 100 we can't increase the supply if we don't at the same time improve our infrastructure and uh you know and and we need people to do that so if you're not doing it through the immigration policy then you've got to you have the right incentives for the people that are here for the youth of today to make it worth their while to take those jobs they've got to be paid properly to do those jobs and they've got to see that those are still jobs that are stepping stones to other 
positions and other careers and not know I can make more money sitting on the sidelines and getting a check from the government right. than rolling up my sleeves and, and, and helping to build infrastructure. Yeah. And David, I've been talking to business owners in the last couple of months. And I mean, it's a pandemic out there with, with the shortage of skilled laborers. You know, there, there's just zero incentive right now for uh, general laborers to go back to work and, 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 and work in the construction industry because they're getting, you know, a, a large check sitting at home and, and saying, hey, there's a shortage of work. There's a shortage of work. Right. And it's creating a problem. It's creating a big, big problem. And, you know, as much as I give the Liberal government credit, you know, in the early stages of COVID to, to roll out those policies, at a certain point, those policies have to be scaled back in a large way and people have to be encouraged to go back to work. Yeah, and, and you've got to look at also, you know, what are, what are our youth of today growing up with? They're growing up in a technology world. They're focused on their on their phones and their computers and and their their technology gadgets to some extent yeah. we we well, live in an entitled world compared right. to but they're looking at, at that's what they believe their their work future is going to be it's going to be doing something on a computer or doing something in that world so they're not as prepared to just go out and take us uh, you know a labor job you know, and dig ditches or build bridges and, and things like that. So it's not going to change. And I don't think unless there's some real incentive for it, like, you know, make, you know, those jobs should be paying more than they are. And they should be paying, you got, you got to be paying something that's better than what they might earn in the technology world right now. Right. Cause right now, you know, there, you know, you know, there's jobs available in, in, in the technology world and, and some of them, they, you know, how many stories they hear about to get rich, you know, in, in that industry um, compared to, you know, can, what can you, can you get rich if you're building infrastructure? Well, you know, I don't know, Dave. I mean, that's a tough one, right? Because I, I think that again creates inflation, right? And I think it creates an issue because you know, technology can be scaled. And, and if I create a program and 100,000 people are using it, you know, then, you know, it's easy for me to leverage that position. But skilled labor, again, you're, you know, you're, you're nailing one nail at a time, right? It's hard to really leverage that. Um, and, and we have to find a way to make these jobs cool and attractive. Right. Um, even from a very young age, right? So, right. I don't know if if maybe the solution is that you know we lower that the, the hours in the construction industry maybe it's seven a.m. to two p.m. you know six days a week and then we use that as an incentive to get people in. I don't know if we you know really focus on on like even even a bigger pension at the end of the day and and stronger unions. I don't know if you know, but somehow we have to make these jobs cool and desirable and and and, and we have to get more people. Um, to line up and, 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 and to explore those options as a career. Yeah, and some of it might come down to supply and demand too, because you know, if the demand is so high to get people to work in that industry, then people are going to be prepared to pay them a lot of money to do that. So we need it, you know, they got to get make more money doing that than they would doing something else. You know, I, I remember growing up in my youth, like for summer jobs, I could, you know, most of my friends at some point for summer jobs were working in the construction industry. Yeah. And, and some of them are, you know, are professional, a lot of them are, are professionals today or successful business owners, and it was never going to be a career, but we needed a job in the summer. You know, those are the jobs that were available and that's what we took. And, and generally they paid more than minimum wage. The guys that took those jobs, they worked really hard in the summer. A lot of my friends got in really good shape doing those things too. And they made way more money than, and people that were taking jobs where you're in an office or, or sitting behind a desk somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, but I don't know if uh, a lot of the youth today will, would accept those jobs. So there has to be enough incentive to do it. And some of it is, you know, how, well, if you can make two or three times the money doing that, then taking some other job, then do it. It doesn't have to be a career, but let it be a, let it be a startup job for a few years or for a summer. Yeah. Dave, a lot of the issues that, you know, we're facing or that Canada is facing are not issues that we're going to solve um, overnight. 
you know, and I, and I just honestly, I look at the political platforms and I look at the conservative, I look at the liberal platform, and I just feel like the main difference between both parties is that, you know, the liberal government seems to want to slap a bandaid on all the issues and, and, and say, hey, we're, you know, we're doing, we're great. We're, you know, giving out this money and solving all these issues, but really they're not, right? They're just kind of living in the day. Whereas I look at the conservatives and I, I see a party that, you know what, has a plan for the future and recognizes the fact that, you know what, we're not going to solve all these issues overnight, you know, but we're going to encourage growth. We're going to encourage businesses to, you know, create new industries, new jobs. And over time, as we work together, you know, these issues are going to get solved in a big way. The, the problem is I think you articulated their position better than than they articulated their position during this election. You know, I, I just don't know if they were getting the, the message out there or if people weren't paying attention to the message, uh, you know, and, and maybe it's because they weren't quite ready for this election to be called. And, uh, and O'Toole wasn't ready and, he, and they, didn't, they weren't sure or they weren't clear on what they were going to do or they didn't have enough time to, to get around the country and, and, and deal with that message. And I think that that was lost. Um, you know, now they probably have another, you know, 18 months to two years to, to get their act together and, and push those messaging and show everybody the difference between what they're proposing and what the liberals who are, who've been in power for a long time have, have, are trying to do or have not done yet, even when they said they were going to do certain things. You know, they did have a majority government. They didn't get a lot of the things done that they, they promised that they were going to do. And now in a minority position, uh, when there's checks and balances, you know, for sure, they're not going to be able to push their whole agenda. But I think it's incumbent on the conservatives and the NDP and the bloc and real to, to be really clear about what they're proposing that's going to be different for the country and, and make it really clear and, and show the differences. Here's our plan. Here's their plan. What, how are you going to be better off with plan A or plan B? Yeah, but again, it's it's that whole, you know, people want instant gratification. You know, they, they want it now, they, you know, and that's the reality of the, of, of, of the times that we live in. And I encourage everybody just to, uh, you know, think a couple couple moves down, down the road and, and look a couple years into the future and start asking some tough questions. How is this debt going to be paid off? You know, are, are our children going to have the burden of paying this debt off and, and, and they will, right? And how will that impact them? And what kind of world are they gonna live in, right? And, and that's, I think, when you start looking at, you know, some of the issues that we're facing today from that perspective, um, you know, that really puts things into perspective. Right? No, it does. And, and like you said, nothing's gonna happen overnight and everybody's looking at how is this affecting me today, but that's not usually what an election is about. You gotta be looking about, How's this going to affect me, you know, four or five years down the road till the next election cycle. But even that it's, it's beyond that. Cause you know, you can't get a lot done in a four year period. It's, it's, it's plans that have to be implemented that might take 10 years to come to fruition or, or, or longer in certain instances, but you still have to be comfortable with the direction that is going in. And you, and you have to be shown, this is the big picture. This is where we're getting to. It's not, okay, there's an election you know, two days ago. So our lives are different today. Like, you know, are our lives any different today than they were two days ago? Like, no, we've got the exact same issues that we had before we spent $650 million. I think uh, what gives, you know, me hope is the fact that the conservatives did win the popular vote. And when you factor in the PPC, which, you know, is a very right winged organization, and if you combine that with the uh, the conservative government, you know we would we would they would be in a much stronger position, and I think conservatives would have won uh, the election. So, um, you know, let's see what happens over the next two years. But I'm I'm happy that we have a minority government. I'm happy that there's checks and balances in place, and you know I think there's a lot of positives to uh, to take out of uh, you know where we're heading. Yeah, no, it's an interesting part of our democracy that 
federal elections are not based on popular vote. Like it would be a, like a different result if it was like, doesn't matter who's in your riding, none of that really matters. You're voting for who's going to be prime minister and who's going to lead. You're voting liberal, conservative, bloc, uh, NDP, green, whatever you want. But you're just, but that's it. That's the only thing that's on the ballot. And whoever gets in with the popular vote then is going to be appointing certain people in your riding locally that are going to be in charge or you know that you could go to. But that's not our system. We're in a, we're in a riding system. And it's winning each riding. It's not winning popular vote, which is sort of a quirk of our of our of our democratic system that it's not it doesn't always seem purely democratic like it's not okay whoever wins the most votes gets to run the country yeah. right it's people who you know who you know got 30 percent of the vote or 33 percent of the vote or something that's who gets to run the country yeah. that means 67 percent were against them or yeah. voted for something else look at the ppc i mean i think they got like eight percent of the popular vote which i mean is uh for a party that was just formed that's absolutely huge, right? And got no seats. They got no seats. Yeah. Right? And, and the Green Party, you know, takes away, you know, popular vote as well, and they end up with two or three seats. Or so. But it, it's just, a, it's a quirk of our system, you know, and, and, you know, Trudeau's in power when, you know, 67% of the population voted against him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But we've got to make it work. Right, they've got to put out policies that make sense, and then and whatever they propose can be tweaked by the other parties, and and eventually we hopefully we get some legislation and not just stagnate until we get to the next election. That's my hope. Yeah, well, ten million million Canadians did not vote, David, and uh, you know that's disappointing because that's one of the uh, you know rights that every Canadian has that you know we fought throughout the ages to have. So. Um, I hope next election, those 10 million people that didn't uh, end up voting um, do vote and uh, they listen to our podcasts and, uh, you know, they, uh, they make an informed decision. And, um, you know, I, I love this country and I know you do as well. And I know every Canadian loves, uh, loves Canada as well. And, um, you know, I'm hopeful that uh, there's, there's a lot of bright times ahead of us. Me too. And, uh, and we'll see, let's give them a chance. You know, that, that's the beauty about a democracy too, okay? Your, uh, liberals won, yep. power, congratulations. Yep. Let's give them a chance. Let's see what they're gonna do. Yep. Let's hope that the opposition parties keep them in check and, and propose constructive changes or, or alternatives to their policies. But let's give them a chance and congratulate them, give them an opportunity. And we'll see. And eventually, they'll, eventually, the beauty of a democracy, eventually there's another election. And if they do a good job, I'll be the first guy to support them. 100%. And if they don't do a good job, then, then we'll, we'll consider a change next time around. And David, I think that's such an important message, right? Because that is true democracy, right? You and I have our own personal opinion, right? But at the end of the day, um, you know, Canada voted in a different way. And, and right. that's okay, right? And I think that's a really strong message to, you know, um, a lot of the people that are not happy with their election results. Um, and, and the message has to be that, you know what? We live in a country that exercises democracy and, 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 and sometimes things are not gonna go your way, but, uh, you know, democracy prevails. And, uh, you know, let's see what happens. But I, I think we have to be supportive of the current situation, you know, voice our concerns, give, give the party constructive criticism and, uh, and move forward through this together. Yeah, I, I agree a hundred percent. At least we're not waking up the day after the election with people yelling the election was stolen. It's fake. It's false. We're not going to accept it. Uh, Trudeau's not the prime minister. Like, you know, thank God we're not in that system in our country. We're prepared to accept the results, even though there, there may have been screw ups in the election, you know, you know, watching those long lineups, you know, in, in Vaughn three hours after the polls closed and people are still in line, haven't voted and they've already called the election and the results are in and, and these people are still standing there and good for them. They're still standing there and getting their votes in. Um, 
but but you know so there'll be some criticism over the you know, the voting system itself but at least we're not we don't have people yelling and screaming it's a false election it's a you know it's fake results and things like that uh, we're prepared i think as case to accept it and uh give them a chance and that's that's the democrats you give them a chance you know we could be critical of them but constructive criticism like you said and i think that's that's a, a, the democratic way absolutely couldn't agree more yeah. all right david well listen let's end it there you know we wish the liberal government uh the best of luck we wish they took a little bit more of a long-term approach and perspective on a lot of the different issues but uh you know, let's see what happens, and uh, and and we'll keep our fingers crossed, and you know, we'll uh, we'll continue to monitor uh, their housing policies and and how they roll different uh, um, campaign promises out, and and we'll continue to monitor how it influences our industry and how it influences agents and and law offices, um, and and the housing market. So, I look forward to uh, everybody joining us on our next podcast. Stay safe. And, uh, and keep investing in real estate. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Looking forward to the next one. All right. Be safe. Be safe. Welcome to David and David on Real Estate. Join us as we explore the ins and outs of the real estate market and dive deep to understand the issues affecting buyers, sellers, investors, and businesses. If you love real estate as much as we do, sit back, relax, and gain an insider's edge to the exciting world of real estate. David Gorski is a broker and the owner of Sutton Summit Realty, a powerhouse brokerage providing guidance to over 180 realtors. And David Corman is a partner at Corman's LLP, a respected law firm specializing in residential and commercial real estate transactions with offices located in Toronto, Mississauga, and Markham.